excuse to talk about it is uh, welcome for me. Just uh, share in the presentation mode. Okay. Just move some of this stuff around. Okay, yeah, so that was a great introduction. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna tell you about the salamanders and I'm gonna start off by uh, telling you a little bit about the mystery that sort of started all of this off. So a person by the name of Wesley Clanton in uh, the early 1930s sort of started seeing some salamanders that weren't quite uh, the same as all of the other salamanders he was used to seeing. So he reported these two distinct forms of Jeffersonium or the Jefferson salamander occupying these same kind of ponds in southern Michigan. And he, one of these forms he called the light form, which were larger in body size. Um, and they laid fewer but larger eggs. And they had relatively large larvae in comparison. And in these same populations, they were generally female biased, which is a little bit strange for an Invistimus salamander uh, system, because usually these tend to find more males than females, especially during the breeding season. But it was as extreme as sometimes up to 52 to one uh, females to males, which was pretty notable and uh, indistinct. And he also found that females produced fe uh, offspring that were like themselves in appearance and sex. And the, a lot of their eggs ended up dying, as many as uh, three quarters of them dying before even uh, turning into uh, developing, developing larvae. And so he you know, made all of these observations and as early as 1934, he made this sort of dire prediction. So as the proportion of light females increases, the chances for the production of males decreases. And in such places, the species must of course become extinct through the failure to produce males. And this is actually uh, within the world of salamanders. This has kind of been uh, turned into or now is now called the Clanton effect or, or the Clanton hypothesis that eventually these, these salamander systems uh, will sometimes eventually push themselves to extinction or may inevitably push themselves to extinction. But of course, now we know that the salamanders that Wesley Clanton was referring to are an interesting and unique animal called unisexual ambistema. And largely we know about these animals and their biology because of the hard work or basically three decades worth of work by a person named Jim Bogart at the University of Guelph. And through a, a, a long and arduous uh, journey of, uh, of experimentation and data collection, he basically uh, uh, gave us our contemporary understanding of these amazing animals. And so unisexual ambistema are an all-female monophyletic lineage. So they're all related to each other and they range in ploidy from two to five. So what that means is instead of having two sets of chromosomes like most of us humans do, we get one set of chromosomes from mom and one set from dad, these unisexual salamanders will sometimes have as many as five sets of chromosomes, but they can vary anywhere from two to five sets of chromosomes. Um, and they always have nuclear DNA from multiple species, and they always have at least one set of chromosomes from the blue-spotted salamander genome. And they're variable and intermediate in appearance between the species that they have DNA from, and so they can look very different from one another. Um, and they reproduce exclusively by stealing sperm from other salamander species that they live alongside. And it turns out that there's five species of Invistimus salamander that the unisexuals can steal sperm from. Um, the blue spotted salamander and Jefferson salamander are the main two that the unisexuals on mainland Ontario steal sperm from. And of course, on Peely Island, they steal sperm primarily from the smallmouth salamander. But in other parts of the range, they can also use sperm from uh, the uh, uh, tiger salamander and the streamside salamander. And uh, the unisexuals, in addition to stealing sperm, they're competing with their hosts for access to resources, as well as access to that sperm. And so I always get this question, how is it that sperm is stealable? And you have to know a little bit about uh, salamander uh, breeding ecology to, to understand this. Uh, so in the early spring, all the salamanders migrate to the ponds. And on Peely Island, this is as early as sometimes in February, but usually the last two weeks of March. Um, and on mainland Ontario, usually it's the early days of April, sometime mid-April, depending on your latitude. 
And so the once they get to these vernal fishless ponds, the uh, males will stop, start uh, dropping little packages of sperm across the bottom of the pond. And these are called spermatophores. And so this male, this is a TT male representing a small male salamander male. And he's dropping little packages of sperm along the bottom of the pond. And really, he's trying to get his sperm to this female who will crawl around on the substrate and then pick up some of that sperm in her cloaca and then fertilize her eggs inside of her body and eventually lay those eggs somewhere else. But alongside in that same pond, there are a number of unisexual salamanders that have a variety of different uh, genomes that are out there also looking for sperm that they need for their eggs to develop as well. And so they're out there uh, picking up some of the sperm as well and competing with the, uh, with the female uh, smallmouth salamanders for access to that sperm. And here's just a, a short video just to give you a sense of what these uh, eggs look like uh, for the Peely Island system, the smallmouth salamander system, because I think some of you who have been used to seeing uh, spotted salamanders and Jefferson salamanders and even blue spotted salamanders might expect to see these, uh, these eggs in little uh, distinct clumps, but smallmouth salamanders lay their eggs usually in these sort of strips across logs or singly and spread out over a, a much larger area. And so these egg clusters look a lot different. And one of the things you'll notice in this video is there's a whole bunch of these white eggs and the white eggs are the ones that have died. And they, this is what happens with uh, a lot of the unisexual eggs. They either don't get fertilized and die or they have some genetic problems when they're developing and they die. But you can see a, a number of those black ones that are kind of like crescent shapes and those are viable uh, and developing larval salamanders that are still in the eggs, haven't hatched out yet. This is still early days. This is actually in March. So this is, these are probably uh, relatively recently laid and they're just uh, developing along. And so the unique sort of breeding ecology of these animals and breeding biology of these animals um, was essentially described by this, this fellow Jim Bogart at University of Guelph. Um, and it goes something like this, the unisexuals produce what we call unreduced eggs. And so basically they, when the mums are producing their eggs, the eggs have all the same DNA of mum, not just one set of chromosomes, they have all of mum's DNA. But in order for those eggs to develop, they need sperm. So they need sperm from the males of another species in order to develop uh, and initiate the, the development of those embryos. But in most cases, that sperm is actually not incorporated into the DNA of their offspring. And so instead, the sperm is just a signal to initiate the development of the eggs, and then the developing uh, embryo will turn into a genetic clone of mum. But sometimes, the sperm is incorporated into the embryo. So some portion of, the, of those developing eggs, the sperm actually will be incorporated into the genome of the offspring. And if that sperm, say in this example, came from a smallmouth salamander, then this, uh, this offspring would have an LLTT genome as opposed to the LLT. So this mom, has two sets of chromosomes from the blue spotted salamander genome and one set from the Texanum. And then they get all of mom's DNA plus the DNA from this sperm, from, from dad. So, so now it's gone up in ploidy. So now they have four sets of chromosomes and this can ratchet up all the way up to five sets of chromosomes. And at that point, there's just too much DNA for the, their little cells to, to contain. But you can very quickly see how you can get a range of, and diversity of different forms of unisexuals, even within the same system over a period of time. And you can get more diversity if you have more hosts available. Now, another thing that's interesting is that this process generally only ratchets up. So you only get more and more and more DNA into your, uh, into your, your genome. Usually you don't lose DNA and go back to sort of a diploid state like, like we're used to seeing in, in most animals like, like humans and, and most of the other vertebrates we're used to thinking about. Um, but there's one unisexual genome, the LLTT or the what we call symmetrical tetraploids, which are uniquely capable of producing reduced diploid offspring. So the only way you can go down in ploidy or get a, a lower number of, uh, of chromosomes is <laughs> by, coming, by coming from a mother who had a symmetrical uh, tetraploid genome. 
And this is actually a hypothesis that's been proposed by Jim Bogart, but still hasn't, hasn't actually been validated in the field. Uh, but this is the only thing that really makes sense of all the data we've collected over, over three decades. And then, of course, once you have a mom who has an LT genome, again, those could ratchet up to be a, a wider variety of other forms of unisexuals again. So you can get LTs just like mom, or you can eventually get new LLTs or new LTTs forming over a period of time. So it's a really unique system, and it goes by the, this term what we call kleptogenesis. It's what we call this form of breeding, um, and it makes these animals very unique. Another thing that makes these, uh, these salamander complexes interesting is that unisexuals tend to outnumber the sexual diploid uh, species that they live alongside. And this is ex exactly the situation that this fellow Wesley Clanton noted in 1934. So here's a little bit of data, uh, a cross section of the salamanders in one of our populations on Pelee Island. And you can see that the bulk of the salamanders in this complex, even though they all look roughly the same, just morphologically, it's very hard to tell these apart. If you look under the hood from a genetic standpoint, you can see that most of those animals are actually these all-female unisexuals, and only uh, just less than 5% of them are actually these bisexual uh, uh, salamanders like smallmouth salamanders and blue spotted salamanders. So all the rest of them, the remaining 95% are actually unisexual salamanders and not these others, these other salamanders like smallmouth salamanders. And so the entire population then is reliant on a very, very small number of male salamanders in the population. And this, in this example, it would only be about 2.4% of the population is basically maintaining this entire system, all the unisexuals, as well as of course, their own population. And then the genetic composition of these uh, unisexuals uh, and the proportion of unisexuals uh, actually changes across life stages. And that's because these individuals that have sort of, we could say too much DNA, like they, these higher ploidy individuals that have three sets of chromosomes, or four sets, or even five sets of chromosomes, which is just a wild thing to imagine. These animals end up not having as high survivorship. So they tend to, to die and, and a portion of them will die essentially at each one of those life stages. So a bunch of them die before even becoming larvae. And then a lot of them die before reaching the adult stage. And one of the things that we notice is that these diploid uh, unisexuals tend to survive much better than these higher ploidy individuals. And so what we can see here is that although these ones are dying, dying back, the diploid unisexuals experience much higher and greater recruitment, better chance of making it to an adult uh, stage and then and contributing to the next generation. So this suggests that there's probably some cost to having these high ploidy uh, genomes. Um, so having the, being one of these three, four or five and individuals. Now, where in the world <laughs> did these unisexuals come from? And historically, they unisexuals were thought to be hybrids and they were even given species names at one point. Um, and it kind of makes sense that they would be hybrids. If you look at their nuclear genome, the, the nuclear DNA is actually identical to the parental species that they live alongside. So if you were to take a look at uh, the nuclear DNA in any of these salamanders within that population, they're gonna have, uh, it's gonna look like a contemporary hybridization event because the nuclear DNA is gonna be exactly identical to the populations that they're living alongside, not just the species they're living alongside. Um, but eventually people realized that um, the story is a little bit different if you look at the mitochondrial DNA. And now the mitochondrial DNA is different from the nuclear DNA because it's only inherited through the maternal lineage. And because unisexuals are all female, we have access to a separate chunk of DNA that we can analyze separately and see if it tells us a different story. And that's exactly what Jim Bogart and his colleagues did. And they found that if you look at the mitochondrial DNA, all of the unisexuals, irrespective of where they come from in their range, are all more closely related to each other than they are to any of their contemporary hosts, even the ones that they live right alongside. And so this tells us that the, the unisexuals are actually not, not contemporary hybrids, but are some lineage that has actually been living uh, and, and evolving along its own trajectory for a really, really long time. And because uh, they were able to access this information from the mitochondria, they can actually use that to get an estimate of how long 
these unisexuals have been doing this. And the estimate they come up with is somewhere between 2.4 to 3.9 million years. So the unisexuals diverged from other uh, Ambistema salamanders uh, somewhere between two to four million years ago. And they've been essentially doing this more or less since then. And so their strategy has been very successful, even though it's hinging on them being living alongside other salamanders. And so I just love uh, talking about this system to some of the students in the classes I teach and then asking them, well, are these animals uh, their own species, because this is this great quote from Charles Darwin, no one definition has satisfied all naturalists, yet everyone seems to know at least vaguely what we mean when we talk about a species. And so are unisexual ambistema a species? Well, you could think of maybe no, because the nuclear DNA isn't distinct, or no, because they rely on other species to reproduce, or maybe yes, because they have unique mitochondrial DNA, or yes, because they're ecologically distinct, or no, I have no idea. And I think all of these answers have some validity. I tend to think of them as a as a, a distinct species because of their unique mitochondrial DNA and their unique evolutionary history. Um, but the great thing is that we don't really have to answer that question if we want to protect them. So um, on, in here in Canada, we don't we don't only protect species. We protect what are called designatable units. And so designatable units don't necessarily have to raise to the bar of being distinct species. And so eventually, under the guidance of Jim Bogart, actually, um, Kasiwik designated uh, special populations or designatable units as separate for uh, these unisexual uh, populations. So they broke the unisexuals up into three distinct uh, populations, what they call the blue spotted salamander dependent population, the Jefferson salamander dependent population, and the smallmouth salamander dependent population. And they did this in part because it makes it a little bit easier to determine whether they should be not at risk, endangered, uh, or uh, or assessed at some other threat level. Because the, we know blue spotted salamanders here in Ontario and in Canada are not at risk. And so it makes sense that the, the, the unisexuals that are living alongside might not might also be not at risk. But the unisexuals that live alongside Jefferson's and, uh, and smallmouth salamanders, maybe we should treat those in, as endangered as well. Uh, especially because they often live alongside or are dependent on Jefferson salamanders and smallmouth salamanders, which are endangered themselves. And you can't readily tell them apart without genetics. And so that's what they did. And that's how they're currently being treated. And so the smallmouth salamander uh, dependent population and the Jefferson dependent population of unisexuals are actually listed as endangered by Kasiwik. And so here's again uh, Wesley Clanton's dire prediction that eventually these unisexuals, maybe they're going to force all of these uh, sexual species uh, to extinction. So maybe actually we should be worried that, that these unisexuals are actually causing the extinction uh, or putting pr additional pressure on these already endangered salamanders. And, you know, that might be possible, but I th really think the story is a bit more nuanced than that. I think actually what's happening is that Unisexuals tend to do the best in areas where habitat suitability for the host is intermediate or a little bit modest. So unisexuals tend to do really well in places where the, the environmental conditions are not optimal for the host, but are maybe tolerable for the primary host like the blue spotted salamander or the Jefferson salamander. And at the same time, humans are going around degrading landscape and degrading salamander habitat. So maybe these cases where we're seeing high proportions of unisexuals and uh, lower and declining rates of, uh, of a, a relative abundance in these endangered species, that's not because of the unisexuals, it's actually because we're altering the habitat, making it better for the unisexuals and worse for the primary hosts. At the same time, we're going around fragmenting and isolating populations that would have normally or naturally prevented or, yeah, like those um, metapopulation dynamics would have allowed for uh, rescue, demographic rescue and recolonization through metapopulation dynamics that are no longer able to occur because we fragmented the landscape. So I think what's actually happening is that uh, these unisexuals and their hosts have been able to find a way to coexist for millions of years 
And so the only reason we're starting to see uh, some issues now is because we're causing them. We're, we're the thing that's to change the environment, not the, not the unisexuals. But how do we find this out? We need a system where we have access to degraded and natural habitats. And we also need a system where we can study a population, where we know all the members of the population, all the subpopulations and who's going in, who's going out. Hopefully it's a closed system that we can understand really well. And Peely Island offers us that. So Peely Island is a really special place in the world. It's uh, one of the most southerly places in all of Canada. It's the same latitude as Rome and California. Um, and Peely Island, if you don't know, is located here in the western basin of Lake Erie. It's part of a chain of islands. Um, and it's special for a lot of reasons. It's a very biodiverse place full of species at risk. Um, and a lot of species they occur nowhere else in Ontario, including the smallmouth salamanders. Our only population of smallmouth salamanders in all of Canada is on this island. And it's also special uh, simply because it's one of the only places in the world where blue spotted salamanders live alongside smallmouth salamanders. So that makes it a really unique place as well, uh, especially for uh, us to study these, these special interactions. Um, so over here we have on the other side of the the graph we uh, of the uh, the page we have a map of Peely Island from the 1860s and then we have a contemporary map and one of the the things that happened to Peely Island in the late 1800s and the like 1890s was they um, they drained the big marsh in the center of the island they created a network of canals that are still operational today and they essentially pumped out all the water to make a garden out of a swamp right and so uh, this was a major undertaking um, and they were very successful in in pulling the water off the land and, and now all of that land is where a lot of the uh, the grapes that are grown for Peely Island uh, Winery, as well as a number of different crops, including uh, soybeans um, and uh, and wheat, uh, as well as some other crops and different crops historically. Um, but yeah, so the the island has shifted from having this giant wetland uh, through much of the island and being heavily forested to now being almost completely agriculture with a small number of remnant wetlands and legacy forest. Um, and again, yeah, Peely Island is the largest island in this archipelago of islands in the western basin of Lake Erie. And again, it's the only one of all these islands that has blue spotted salamanders. And it's again, the only one that has both blue spotted salamanders and smallmouth salamanders. And so it's a very special place in the world. Now, this island was separated from the mainland through the uh, raising water levels in Lake, in what's now Lake Erie. Uh, following glaciation, and they've been isolated from the mainland for about four to 6,000 years, depending on the geologist you, you talk to. Uh, but yeah, so these animals have been able to coexist on this island since then, and even coexist still, despite all the, the widespread landscape changes. Now, I keep harping on this idea that they have both of these species living alongside one another. And the reason why this is special is because you can get a number of different uh, unisexual genoma types or these different forms of the unisexuals um, that you couldn't get if you only had one of those sperm donors. So if you look at the blue arrows, that would show you all the different unisexual forms that you could get if you only had the blue spotted salamander uh, or only had access to sperm from a blue spotted salamander. And the orange arrows show the same sort of thing if you only had access to the smallmouth salamander. And so if you have both of those, you get a wider diversity of different uh, possible unisexual genomotypes. But it turns out that because of this amazing sort of interaction between the two species, and because of these, um, these uh, symmetrical tetraploids, the LLTT in the, in the bottom right figure, being able to produce new diploid unisexual offspring, those LTs, then you can get sort of a recycling and a diversification that actually further increases the number of unisexual forms that could be possible and that you could see in this population that you couldn't see in any population that only had one of these two sperm donors. So, uh, the fact that you have access to two sperm donors is very, very special because it increases the diversity of the unisexual forms that you have on Peely Island. It also increases the genetic diversity within each one of those forms. So even within that one LLT form, you're going to have a much uh, wider range of diversity of different types of LLTs, so LLTs with different, with different genes, as a direct result of there being access to two sperm donors. So it makes it a really special system, Peely Island. 
And so in 2015, we started this long-term project on Pelee Island, and we studied the animals at various uh, parts of its life. Uh, as we go try to get there as, as often as we can in March, because that's when the salamanders breed. We put minnow traps in the water, and we, we catch the animals when they're in the breeding ponds. We measure them. Uh, and then we apply some marks, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. We also visit them again uh, when they're in their larval stage, so we can catch them and take tissue from them when they're a little bit larger. Uh, so we don't have to, uh, we don't have, we don't, all that tissue sampling is done non-lethally. We can sample the larvae at a stage where we can take tissue without killing them. Um, and we take all of the, those genetic samples and we can figure out who's who, and we can also better understand the shift and the survival across all of those different stages. And so some, just a, a few of the uh, like short summary of our project achievements so far, we've discovered a number of new populations on the island that were not previously known. We've determined the ge genetic population uh, across uh, of different subpopulations across the island. Um, we've uh, monitored the population size at a number of sites. We've started characterizing and mapping the terrestrial habitat and the connectivity among known sites. We've started to characterize the breeding habitat, what makes a good breeding pond, and evaluated the conservation value of the existing constructed ponds and maybe think about how we can make those better. And finally, we've been identifying areas for restoration and habitat creation. So these are all things that we've been able to do uh, through uh, the time from 2015 until now. But getting there to work on Peely Island is a challenge and it makes everything that we do on that island harder than it would be on the mainland. Uh, one of the hardest things to do is to get there with all of your gear in, in March because the ferry stops running uh, in the early December and what really only runs from about April 1st until uh, until mid-December, early to mid-December. And so if you want to get to the island outside of that, you have to fly over by plane. And there is regular flights, but it's very limited in terms of the luggage and baggage that you can, you can get, that you can carry over there. And so what we have to do is we have to stash a truck on the island in December so we can recover it in March. We have to stash all of our food and gear over there in March to have a little cash. But And even the field station where we normally stay, it's not winterized, so we can't even stay there. We've had to find other solutions uh, for places to stay in March while we're doing some of that work. Uh, but it's exciting and we've found a solution and we've been able to do some really fun stuff. So, of course, when we get there, it's awesome because um, there's only about 100 people who stay on the island over the winter and everybody is curious to see what we're up to. Well, not everybody, but a lot of people. And we get to meet some some people and have nice conversations and take them on salamander walks. And here's a picture of me uh, setting out some of our uh, our minnow traps that we use to catch the uh, the salamanders when they go to the ponds. Uh, so we deploy those traps and then uh, we check them every 12 hours and you can see that we've caught a bunch of salamanders in in this trap and we put them in the buckets and then we can bring them back to the place where we're actually going to process them which basically means measure them and, and give them a mark and so yeah so we collect those those animals we take a bunch of measurements and then we mark them using a technique called visible implant elastomer. So this is a, a, a fluorescent sort of uh, elastic that uh, is injected as a liquid just underneath their skin. And as a, it, it'll, very, it'll cure within a, a couple hours and um, it sort of forms to their body and it's stretchy and flexible. So it doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, interfere with their body movements. And that'll stay inside the animal for the lifetime of the animal. And it's something that we can see if we flash like a, a light, a uh, UV light at the, at the marks, we can actually see those marks underneath the skin. And it's a, it's a really uh, excellent non-lethal um, way to mark the animals. And once we mark them once, we don't have to mark them again. Again, like those marks last the lifetime of the animal and they're not ambiguous. So we can, uh, it's a really re reliable technique uh, for something like a salamander, which is usually a challenge to actually mark. And then we take, uh, after we've marked the animals and taken our measurements, we take a small tip of their tail, uh, two to five millimeters of tissue off the end of their tail, and they grow back their tails very quickly. And often even within the same year, we'll catch the individual again and we'll see that they've regrown their tail. Um, and so we can take that tissue and that's how we can figure out who they are. But again, once they're marked, we, we don't ever have to take tissue again. And these animals can live decades or sometimes up to maybe as much as 30 years. We still don't know their maximum lifespan. 
here's what the marks look like uh, underneath your skin. So this is back in 2015 when we were only applying four marks. Now we apply six marks because we add a cohort mark to the center of their body, uh, which tells us the year that it was marked. But back in 2015, we didn't know how long the project was going to last. And we didn't also, we also didn't anticipate having so much success in finding all these animals. So we ran out of codes and we had to come up with a new system. But you basically get the idea here. You can see the, the four marks and you flip the salamander over and you read it like a book. So orange, 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 yellow is the code uh, for the one on, on, on your left. In the middle, it's orange, red, red, red. So O-R-R-R. -R -R. And on the on the on the right it would be orange, orange, yellow, blue, and so that's how we that's how we uh, get the codes, and those codes again will last the lifetime of the animal. And so we get to go to some amazing places, beautiful places on the island that include both natural habitat, uh, like uh, some of the uh, the Parks Canada properties, um, but also places that are essentially reclaimed cattle or livestock ponds or other constructed ponds uh, across uh, different uh, levels of secondary succession um, and, and rest restoration patches across the island. And uh, yeah, we'll go, we'll wade into those uh, outside of the breeding season uh, to catch the larvae and we can sample them that way. We also take a bunch of aquatic and terrestrial data. So one of the threats that people have been uh, curious about for a long time on Pelee Island is the wild turkey. So if you know anything about Pelee Island, you might've heard about um, the pheasant hunt. They have a pheasant hunt on Pelee Island where they release pheasants and uh, and people go and, uh, and shoot the pheasants. Um, the number of, uh, People hunt, hunting uh, and participating on that hunt has has changed over time, but it's a it's a very um, uh, economically important part of the Pelee Island uh, the Pelee Island economy. Uh, but they introduced wild turkeys in 2002 as well. Uh, they introduced 25 birds, but now the population is much much larger. Just like the rest of Ontario, P the turkeys have done really really well, and on Pelee Island, turkeys have done extremely well. So people, including myself, will see flocks of turkeys that are 300 birds strong, and that's not even all the birds on the island, of course. So lots and lots of turkeys on the island, and that got a lot of people worried, uh, especially at the time of, uh, of release, that these because these turkeys are opportunistic and generalist sort of predators, and maybe they're going to start eating some of these species at risk that are on the island, including the blue racer, maybe the, the young youngling uh, uh, yearling blue racers, but maybe also salamanders and and other things like species at risk snails. Um, yeah, and again, the po population has grown uh, incredibly. And they may have uh, these these devastating consequences for the salamanders and uh, through destroying their habitat or also uh, through just directly eating them. And so, yeah, we thought about this a lot at the very beginning of the project. Um, so from a predator's perspective, salamanders are probably only a relatively small component of the turkey's diet. But that doesn't mean that salamanders uh, are not at, at, at risk because of turkeys, right? So even if salamanders are only a small component of the turkey's diet, turkeys can still pose a problem if predation removes the larger and older animals, which are important for, uh, for keeping the population afloat, if they're disproportionately removing those small uh, in number but important uh, individuals like the smallmouth salamander or the, the host, or if the predator population is large and increasing, which we know it is in, in the case of turkeys. Um, so we actually, we ran this experiment and this experiment was doing kind of two things. One, getting some baseline data on predation rates, but also to, uh, to better understand this other th cool thing that the salamanders do, which is raise their tail. So they, put, they adopt this defensive posture as a way to sort of guard their themselves against predators. And so we were interested in not only uh, getting some sort of baseline predation rates to understand what's going on with turkeys, but also trying to answer, well, why are they doing this, this tail raising behavior? behavior when they're scared. And the, the, the uh, idea we had is that maybe they're raising this, their tail up as a way to deflect the, the predator strikes away from the head and towards the tail. And so we deployed, well, I shouldn't say we, it's the royal we, because it was a grad student named Alex Mayette. He did all of this work. Uh, he deployed uh, 1,600 models, and we had camera traps up to try and track who the predators were. And we got some really cool uh, footage. Here's just a raccoon eating one of the clay models 
Um, so yeah, the, the clay walls were attacked by uh, both raccoons as well as turkeys. Um, and we can actually tell who the predator was because we can find fragments of these models with the bite marks. And one of the neat things about that is that we can also figure out not just whether they were attacked, but who was the person or the predator who actually attacked them and where across the body did they get attacked? And so uh, this is what we did. And we found that mammals are, are primarily tar targeting the head. So if there's a, an attack on the head, it's usually from a mammal, um, but attacks on the tail came from both mammals and turkeys and not so much from, from other passerines. Um, but mammals and turkeys are primarily attacking uh, the tail mainly when the tail is raised, so in that defensive posture. So this was kind of support for this idea that the salamanders are raising their tail as a way to deflect strikes away from their head and body and towards their tail, which is chemically protected with a, a sort of a white goo that they release from their tail that's, that's unpalatable and the predators don't like. So it's good evidence that that's how it works. But in addition, what we learned was that the, the phenology of attacks varies between the different predators. So it's likely that raccoons are probably more important as predators very early in the breeding season and early in, in the, in the uh, uh, yeah, when the, when the adult salamanders are, are mostly active. And it's not until late summer that really turkey predation starts to become an issue. And it's likely that turkey predation then would be more of a problem for those dispersing juveniles, which are also often adopting uh, light areas of light cover, which are easy to, for the, the turkeys to flip. So it's probably not the adults that are, that are uh, susceptible, very, very susceptible to turkey predation. It's probably mostly those dispersing juveniles. So now let's get on to some of the uh, additional data that we've been collecting across Peely. This gives you an idea of the cross-section uh, or the genetic composition of some of the different populations across the island. And so this is work that's uh, being compiled by another graduate student we're working with. His name is Evan Baer. And so he's been taking some of our genetic data and then trying to better understand patterns of diversity and what might generate the differences across the island. Um, so one of the things from a conservation perspective that we were interested in is understanding what proportion of these populations are actually smallmouth salamanders, what proportion are blue spotted salamanders, and what proportion are these other unisexuals. Um, and one of the things that we, we learned is that some of the places where the salamanders used to be, uh, his, when the historical work was done in the 80s and early 90s, the salamanders are no longer there. So that was sad, but we, we did actually find a number of places on the island that had never been previously surveyed where the salamanders actually were. So we discovered a number of new populations. Um, so many of these sites actually did have smallmouth salamanders. So we've expanded the, 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 the known distribution of, of the smallmouth salamanders on the island. And the sites vary dramatically in their genetic composition, not just the proportion of, of smallmouth salamanders, but also the composition of the unisexual forms as well. Um, so in some sites, like you can see in this uh, B6 site, there's almost no smallmouth salamanders. It's basically the population is less than a percent of all the salamanders at that site are actually smallmouth salamanders. But at other sites, it's, it's, a, it's approaching numbers like almost up to 20%, so 18% at some of these sites, like in D3.1, for example. Um, but overall, across all of the island, our, our overall average is about 5.8% of all the salamanders we've captured and genotyped were actually smallmouth salamanders. And only two individuals that we've caught across all of our samples from 2015 all the way up until this past year are actually blue spotted salamanders. So blue spotted salamanders actually uh, are also something that has likely declined in a significant way, possibly even a more significant way than the smallmouth salamanders here on Peely Island. So in addition to all this genetic uh, uh, composition data, we've been collecting population size data. Uh, and this is some population size data that we used, uh, uh, one method called a Schnabel estimate. And this tells us how many salamanders were in the pond at the time of breeding. And these are likely going to be a little bit of an underestimate because we know that some of the salamanders that, that, uh, at, that live at some of these sites don't breed every year. Um, because they sometimes will skip two, maybe three years between breeding bouts. And of course, we missed two years because of COVID. Um, so we were unable to collect uh, population size data uh, during that time, but we were able to collect some data in 2022. And it looks like things are roughly where they were, where they were when we were last there in 2019. 
But we can take this population size data and we can combine it with the data that we've collected on genetic composition. And we can get back of the envelope calculations, at least initially until we get some better data to estimate how many uh, salamanders or how many smallmouth salamanders there are at each of these pop in each of these populations. And the numbers are actually shockingly small. So we're looking in some of these populations, maybe 30 individuals, but probably closer to five to 10 at the site we call B6, but D3.2 uh, and 3.1, we're talking about 30 or maybe as many as 100 at D3.1. So very, very small numbers of animals, even though we have populations that have thousands and possibly uh, 2,000 or more uh, animals in each of these populations. Um, so again, some populations have higher proportions, but we can combine that with the population size to get these back of the envelope estimates. So eventually we're going to be have enough data that we can apply some more sophisticated population models, get a little bit better estimates and, and uh, put some uh, uh, finer points on this data. Uh, but this is just to give you a sense of how, how few animals there actually are on the landscape that are actually these pure smallmouth salamanders. So are the smallmouth salamanders in decline? Well, we have some historical data. Uh, going back to 1980s and 1991, they indicate that the relative abundance of smallmouth salamanders was on the island was about 14.8%. Um, so 14.8% of the salamanders that were captured were smallmouth. But in our contemporary larval samples, so this was larval sample data, so we wanted to compare apples to apples. So we used our uh, larval sample data, which showed that only about 2.9% were actually smallmouth salamanders. So um, that's very low, and it looks like there's been a significant decline. Um, in addition, two of the sites where they we knew they were are, are no longer present, um, but three sites have been newly discovered. So, I mean, maybe it's a wash uh, on that front. But if we, if we actually just look more detailed at site by site comparisons, it looks like those sites that used to have a fair number, uh, a fair proportion of their population as smallmouth salamanders, it looks like there's been some uh, important declines in the relative abundance of, uh, of, of smallmouth salamanders. And the one site where we didn't find a significant decline already had a very low number of smallmouth salamanders to begin with. Now let's look at blue spotted salamanders. Let's not forget about them because they're still there and they seem to be in trouble as well. So the relative abundance in the historical samples was about 6.8%. 6, uh, 6 and they're no longer present at two of the sites where we, where we have sampled, but, uh, and we know they were, but they're no longer present there. Um, and there's also one privately owned site um, that we know that they were, that's probably the population stronghold, uh, but it's uh, a place that we haven't been able to, to secure permission to survey, so we haven't surveyed it, and it hasn't been surveyed in over 30 years, so we don't really know what's going on there. But there are two contemporary sites that uh, were not previously identified that we did identify with our samples, and again, only two pure uh, blue-spotted salamanders were captured to date. Um, and so if we look at the island level, it does seem like these, uh, these animals are actually in decline. The blue spotted salamanders might actually be facing a more severe decline uh, or maybe even in bigger trouble than the smallmouth salamanders. And we do care about the blue spotted salamanders on Peely Island as well because they're genetically distinct from the mainland Ontario populations because they've been isolated for four to 6,000 years from the mainland. So this is somewhere maybe in the neighborhood of up to possibly a thousand generations since isolation. Um, and we know even just from a small amount of genetic work, nuclear and mitochondrial, that the blue spotted salamanders that are on Peely Island are distinct from those on Rondo in Southern Ontario uh, and the, even the mitochondrial half of the type of those um, Peely Island blue spotted salamanders are different from the ones on the mainland. And again, going back to this idea of the two host issue, if we lose blue spotted salamanders, it becomes an issue for the diversity and uh, and uh, you know overall genetic diversity of the unisexuals on Peely Island. So without laterality, you go from a situation where you have all this diversity, both in the form of, of unisexuals, but also within each one of those forms, and you go to a system where you have a much more simplistic situation with only three or four different unisexual forms. So you lose genetic, genetic diversity and you lose the symmetrical tetraploids, so no new lineages can get created. So we don't want that to happen, and we've been trying to convince um, Kasiewicz to consider uh, uh, 
whether or not blue spotted salamanders, the Pelee Island blue spotted salamanders, could be um, evaluated on their own merit, and uh, and yeah, that that might be possible. We'll we'll look into that. Okay, uh, so a, a few other things just briefly that we've uh, we've learned about the population. We've got baseline habitat data. We know uh, from a microhabitat perspective what kinds of, uh, of conditions they require in terms of soil moisture, canopy cover, soil temperature, and soil pH, what they can tolerate, what's too high, what's too low, and that's useful information. Also, we've collected uh, information on microhabitat uh, selection, trying to basically understand whether smallmouth salamanders use a different microhabitat than the uh, unisexual salamanders. And that does seem to be the case, particularly when it comes to soil moisture. So smallmouth salamanders like their soil a lot wetter than the unisexuals that they live alongside. And so this red line here, uh, the, the red line in both of these plots actually is the smallmouth salamanders and the black lines are uh, the, um, the unisexuals. And you can see that they like the, the wetter soils. Um, and it, even when it comes to the unisexuals, those unisexual forms that have more uh, unisex or uh, more smallmouth salamander DNA like wetter habitats as well. So it does seem to be that that, that Texanum DNA is related to uh, a preference for wetter habitats. And that makes sense because smallmouth salamanders are wetland specialists and they usually don't disperse very far from their wetland habitats. So now that we have this basic understanding that unisexuals and smallmouth salamanders are likely different in their habitat requirements, we thought now it's time to, to put some of this data that we've collected uh, into uh, a GIS and try and get some sort of maps that show habitat suitability. And so we picked a couple variables that we thought were likely to be important and influence habitat suitability, like elevation, soil type, and distance from the, from the breeding pond. And we combined that with our, our occurrence data and we were able to generate these maps. And again, when I say the Royal Week, because this is actually work that a, another graduate student, Graham Smith, uh, has, has been working on. Um, so Graham actually uh, has graduated now and ha now has a job with the Nature Conservancy of Canada. Um, and so, uh, yeah, this, the, here are these, these distribution maps. And one of the things that we were able to, to learn about the habitat is that the smallmouth salamanders do tend to remain closer to their breeding sites, probably because they like that wetter, those wetter soil conditions. Poorly drained soils were also much more important for smallmouth salamanders than for the unisexuals. And the unisexuals can tolerate a much more marginal set of conditions compared to um, the smallmouth salamanders. So the range of environmental conditions that the, the unisexuals can tolerate is much wider than what the smallmouth salamanders can tolerate. But another thing that we can do with these maps is we can actually estimate roughly how much area around the pond we should try to protect. If we want to protect habitat, we need to know how much habitat around the breeding sites we should protect. And so this mapping exercise and this habitat suitability exercise allowed us to, to sort of get these quantitative estimates of how much habitat around the breeding pond is likely to be important for the smallmouth salamanders in particular. And so from our modeling exercise, we were able to say that that's about 400 meters. So um, right now only about three 300 meters is generally protected around the pond, and uh, our work suggests that much more of that habitat should actually be under protection. But the model itself is also something that we can use as a tool to evaluate where and how we should create new habitat. We have this ocean of red unsuitable habitat. Well, that's those are places that we should try to change from red to green. And so this map actually tells us maybe how and where we should be able to do that. And we can actually use these models to do that. So that's what we've been doing, working with agencies like the Nature Conservancy of Canada to maybe make suggestions about places uh, on the landscape where we could, uh, we could actually engage in some meaningful restoration. Um, and so here is the next step uh, of Graham's work, which was to evaluate the connectivity among known populations on the island. And he did this using a cool technique called circuitscape. So circuitscape is this idea that you can uh, look at the, the landscape like an electrical current, and you can look at how the current flows through the landscape based on the resistance to movement. And so it's a metaphor, but it actually is uh, the mathematical way that it works is exactly like an electrical current. 
So you take a landscape like this and then you convert it into what we call a resistance layer. So some of these land types are low resistance, which allow movement of the animals. Some of these, these cells are high resistance, which would make it harder for the animal to move through the, uh, the, the landscape, just like it would make it harder for electricity to move through that area as well. And so we can ask now, how is the salamander going to get to the pond? Is it going to go a straight line or is it going to go into the forest, the low resistance, resistance forest, and take a more long way, but maybe a lower resistance uh, method? And so we, we can actually do this on Peely Island, and that's what Graham has gone ahead and done. And again, we're using this circuit theory to basically develop a map of connectivity among the populations. This also helps us get a sense of where dispersal corridors might actually be. So we have uh, one of the take home messages that was kind of a bit unfortunate um, was that overall habitat connectivity is very low. Among the different populations on the island, ha habitat connectivity is very low. And even along those, what we call the least cost paths. So the paths that the salamander might take to get from one population to another, those are usually longer than the, dis the dispersal capability of the animal and also are not only a high resistance, but also low habitat suitability pathways. So it means that it's unlikely that there's a lot of exchange of individuals among these populations because of how fragmented the populations are now. Uh, but again, we can use this model as a tool to evaluate other things and other threats like road mortality risk. So we can take this model, we can clip out the roads, and we can say, well, where is it that salamanders are likely to be crossing these roads? And so we can actually put little boxes around these and we can say these are the places where we should be targeting road mitigation efforts. So if we're if we if we have a limited amount of resources and we want to um, target places where we can protect salamanders that might be crossing roads, these are the places where we should be we should be looking and we can do that simply because of these these effective models. Okay, another really uh, neat project I just want to mention is uh, looking at the habitat suitability of the of the ponds. So looking at the breeding sites across the island, trying to understand what makes a, a one breeding site better than another breeding site, and are the constructed ponds that are existing across Peely Island that have been created over the last 20 years, are they doing a good job at providing habitat for salamanders? Some of them were created just haphazardly or opportunistically, but it's not clear that they're actually doing a good job at providing suitable habitat. So we went around to all of these ponds, including natural ponds and constructed ponds, and tried to get a sense of what's creating a good, a good pond for these animals. So we collected a whole bunch of environmental data, um, and it turns out that canopy cover, high canopy cover and crayfish burrow presence were associated with, uh, with the presence of salamanders in those ponds and the catch per unit effort. So like the relative abundance of salamander larvae in these ponds was also increased by the leaf litter in the substrate and the presence of submergent vegetation. So uh, there's other plants that are in, in, those, uh, in those ponds. So those are the things that really influence the, the, the pond quality. And we can see that constructed ponds actually have less of those things. They have less canopy cover, they have less leaf litter in the substrate, they have warmer water, and fewer of them, of them contain submergent vegetation. And as a consequence, the larvae that are caught are lar only uh, larvae are only caught in 33% of the constructed ponds that we surveyed. And the catch per unit effort within those ponds, so the relative abundance of larvae in those ponds, is four to ten times lower than comparable natural ponds. So this kind of sounds like, well, constructed ponds are not doing a good job, and that's that's true that the existing ones uh, that we studied were not doing a good job. But it tells us how we can change them to, so that they can do a better job, right? So we have to do things like plant trees around the margin, somehow get leaf litter in that substrate, somehow make sure there's submergent vegetation. We need to do things to help these ponds along to make them more suitable, maybe make them naturalize more quickly. But because we also know the age of these ponds, the age of these constructed ponds, we can actually look at how long it's going to take them to reach the situation where they naturalize to being uh, approximately as suitable as a natural pond. And the sad story is that it's going to take probably more than 20 years 
for these constructed ponds to reach a, a comparable habitat suitability to natural ponds. So the takeaway message is that you can't just create a pond and hope that it's going to be as good as a natural pond, even in five to 10 years, maybe even in 20 years, it still won't be as good as the existing uh, natural pond. So we need to make sure that those natural ponds are protected and then supplement or support those populations by building additional constructed ponds in a good way and helping them through the naturalization process to speed them up to help make sure that they become as suitable as possible as soon as possible. But there's a new threat on the horizon. So this is something that we uh, have just recently, recently published. This just came out in December. There's a new species of crayfish uh, that uh, has is now widespread and well established on the island. So this is uh, Procam Procambaris uh, acutus, the white river crayfish, which is a uh, non-native uh, crayfish to Canada. This is the first time it's been documented in Canada. Uh, we found it not only here on Pelee Island, but there's actually now a few observations on mainland Ontario as well. And this spells trouble possibly for a number of our native crayfish, because this is a relatively large bodied animal. Um, and uh, the salamanders, particularly smallmouth salamanders on Pelee Island, rely on the crayfish burrows that are created by the digger crayfish. So digger crayfish make these amazing burrows uh, in the water, or sorry, in the mud, in, uh, and they, these semi-terrestrial crayfish, the burrows that they create are important habitat for the smallmouth salamanders. And so if the, the crayfish could pause, cause a problem for the salamanders either by eating the salamanders directly or by outcompeting or displacing these native crayfish. So that's something I just wanted to mention uh, and that everybody should be keeping an eye out for these animals and reporting them uh, either to the authorities or on iNaturalist if you see these anywhere in Ontario, these, these uh, Procambaris uh, White River crayfish. And then I wanted to end the talk just by talking about um, some of the amazing work that uh, that the Nature Conservancy of Canada has been doing to create wetlands across the, uh, across the island. And we've been uh, fortunate enough to have been in a position where we had data that we could help, uh, help the NCC actually guide their efforts in terms of how, where, uh, uh, to create these, these new breeding habitats. And so they had an area for earmarked for wetland restoration, and they wanted to know, well, how big and how deep do we build these ponds? Where should we place them? And because we had already done all this work, we actually had some, some useful data to help inform that. And so that's what we, we were able to do. They were able to build uh, three of these ponds, particularly at this site, but they've built ponds at other, at, at other sites as well. And these ponds, uh, they, were, they did everything that we we expected them to or, or asked them to do. And so that includes building them right adjacent to a tree line, uh, supporting the restoration work by putting, by planting trees around, around the margin, making sure it's the right size and depth and all of these things that are gonna help support the naturalization process. Um, and uh, here's an example of some chinkapin oaks that have been planted around this area. Also, not just around the trees, around the ponds themselves, but also in this field, sort of push it towards a forested habitat. So NCC is doing a lot of great work on the island. We were able to study these ponds as well because we were there already doing some of this work. And uh, we use this technique called a drift fence pitfall to catch the emerging salamanders as they as they leave the ponds. So we dig these uh, these holes, we put some paint cans with some drainage holes in them, sink them into the ground, and then we put a little rock over them. And the salamanders walk along, they fall into the trap, and then we can catch them and we can tell, well, how many of these, uh, the larvae that we catch in these ponds are actually making it through to becoming metamorphosing or new metamorph uh, salamanders and potentially going on to breed in the future. Um, and yeah, we have these rocks over to mitigate to raccoon predation and a stick to allow any mammals to escape. So yeah, and we again, we're checking these traps every 12 hours. Um, and the exciting thing, really, the really uh, amazing thing was that we started catching uh, some of these metamorph uh, salamanders, including some smallmouth salamanders in the second year that the of these ponds being created. Um, and it's really exciting just to see uh, sort of evidence-based conservation working, right? So we've seen uh, all these constructed ponds in other places in Ontario, not or, or even on Pelee Island, not doing such a good job. And we we see these ponds that were created specifically and strategically uh, in a way to maximize their suitability for the animals and they're being used immediately uh, after being constructed and are now producing salamanders that will hopefully go on to produce uh, more salamanders and help and maintain the salamander community on Pelee Island. So this salamander is actually the first salamander ever to emerge 
from that pond, uh, from that newly that new pond. We were there to actually catch the first salamander ever to emerge from that pond. And to me, this is just this animal itself really is just the embodiment of evidence-based conservation in practice. So with that, I think I'll just uh, put this up here to acknowledge some of the important collaborators on this project, including people who have provided us land access, but also Dennis Murray and Jeff, Jim Bogart, Jeff Hathaway and Chris Wilson, who have been important uh, collaborators in this project throughout the throughout the the whole history of the project, um, as well as the number of student researchers who have contributed uh, sweat, <laughs> tears, and blood, well, hopefully not too much, except for the mosquitoes maybe sucking their blood um, uh, in, in meaningful ways to the project. Um, and yeah, with that, I'll take, I'll take any questions.